So I'm very excited. My next guest on the Isolation Interviews is a fantastically talented presenter. It is, of course, Matt Allwright. Thank you for joining me. That's very kind, Matthew. You, yeah, that's... You, you should check my work more. It's not that. It's not that great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's very lovely to speak to you. It's good to see you again. I mean, um, I've interviewed you twice before. You actually came down to our studios in Reading. Um, yeah. oh, that must be about three years ago now, I believe. Uh, at least, yeah. It's a little while ago now. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, our studios have changed a bit since you were last there. So once everything's back to normal, we'll have to get you in. But how is everything going for yourself since, uh, obviously, the, the world's gone mad? How are you, how are you coping with lockdown? How are you um, getting on with things? Um, because I'm freelance, I think uh, I'm kind of used to a, um, a bits and bobs kind of existence. I think the thing I found most difficult is I've got, I've got kids, both of school age, and for them to have been off and... Uh, not really knowing what the future holds for them because all you do as a parent is worry about your kids and, and what, what they're going to do with their lives and it makes you realise that if you take away that structure that they've got um, and give them nothing really to be absolutely sure about um, then you, it, it makes it difficult to do your job as a parent um, really. I think that more clarity is coming through now you know, but my daughter missed her GCSEs, she missed her last day of school. And those are things she worked incredibly hard towards. And to watch that and not be able to offer any kind of answers or, or solutions um, for the, you know, the people you care most about, I think that's quite difficult. Um, for me, I mean, you know, it's, I get to read. I mean, I've, I'm working my way through the complete works of George Orwell. I'm making music, I'm collaborating online. These are just things that I, I wanted to do. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say it. it's not a great time. It's far from it. There are people suffering in terrible, but there is an opportunity along with everything else that goes on. There's an opportunity to do things differently and that's always good. I think that's the thing with at the moment is that because we've never known this sort of situation before, no one knows what's going to happen next. No one knows how to deal with it. So we're all just sort of muddling through together, really. Yeah, we are. And and actually the opportunity to to work it out day by day. And, you know, I, I look at my wife and we, she looks at me and and every day is like, right, what's what's today going to bring? What is today going to bring? What's it? Is it going to be an announcement from the chancellor? You know, we're going to find out something from the kids school. Uh, kids schools uh, you know are we gonna discover something about my job that, that changes uh, and every day is, is bringing with it something at the moment that fundamentally questions the life that we've had for years leading up to this thing and I, I think there is a lot of positive to be taken from that obviously it's a terrible price to pay for for a lot of people for a lot of families who, who are, are losing loved ones but but I'm not part of that. I'm not. I'm not part of that. And only the news brings that reality to me, and makes you realise there's a reason why this is all taking place. You know, and th that juxtaposition is like, it's like there's a war front somewhere else, and we're just at home, just keeping our own stuff going. And, and you know, and you don't really get to look into that world very often. I mean, although it is a terrible situation that's going on, it, I would say it has brought a lot of people closer together. Although you can't, you know, go out and hug your neighbours and spend time face to face, you're able to. I think it's brought a lot of people closer together with in terms of FaceTiming, um, giving people a call, just talking more. Would you agree? I think I think definitely uh, spending time in, in ways like this uh, makes you appreciate the value of your community of, of, of friends and family um, because you, you see them uh, through a different window now and without you, you almost, it, I almost feel like I've taken people's physical proximity for granted <laughs> for far too long. I mean, the very fact of being able to stand in a room with people and like watch a gig or go to the pub, God, I miss the pub so much. And I, <laughs> Now, if you'd said to me, um, like, six months ago, you can't go down the pub again, I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> but just that physical, the show of people parading themselves, drinking and laughing and, and having fun, 
I miss that so much. You know, I really, I really like that more than I had realized before. But I, I think about obviously um, the other side of this, what I've gr appreciated, I've always appreciated, I think, but you probably understand this better than I do is, is the incredible work our NHS does. I know it feels like a cliche almost now, but it, but if we take nothing else away from this, is that we see the jewel that we have in our NHS, the people that, you know, working at the, the station there, you, you know those people much better than I do, and so you're much more aware of it, but we should never, ever take that for granted again. And whatever we do, we should protect and enhance that organisation because it's just phenomenal what they're doing right now. And I mean, the, the, the NHS has been fantastic, you know, forever. But it, I think times like this is when it really shows what a, uh, an amazing job they do and just how important they are to, to, to this country. And I think we we're very lucky that we have them. But like, you know, as I say, we're, you know, the hospital radio, we're at the moment not able to go and ward visit, which is obviously understandable. But it, we kind of don't get to see what, you know, we, it's, it's, it's just a weird situation. We're unable to sort of see the amazing work they're doing at the moment, but they're still there. They're fighting away. They're doing their job and they're doing it you know, to the best they can at the moment. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I just think that's one of those things that I, I, when we get to the other side, is I don't want to lose I don't want to lose that feeling, that that un understanding and appreciation of so many things that are happening during this this um, this moment, during this crisis. That that if we don't, um, you know, if we don't take that lesson and we don't carry it with us long term, then we are not doing justice to the people who we've lost actually, because that's the price that that they've paid for us to learn and progress and improve. And, you know, and we're certainly not doing justice to the people who are out there, you know, in the wards and, and in care homes and in communities doing their job to, to try and keep us as safe as they can at the moment. So when we do eventually come out of this, do you think as a nation we will change or do you think we'll slip back into old habits? I, I really worry that we'll slip back into old habits um, because... The kind of easy way of doing things is so appealing now. It just depends whether a lot of the easy ways of doing things will still be there. Um, you know, like eating out. I, I, I think that's one of the things that, that a lot of people have spoken about. And I, th I don't think it's a cliche. I think it's real. Is that people have a much greater appreciation of food. Because in those first couple of weeks particularly, there was that real feeling that there might not be food. There might not be food. And we have over like two or three decades now just got more and more used to the idea of not just food being there, but exactly the kind of food that we desire at any given moment should be available to us within minutes. And when that's taken away, it makes you start asking questions about about where does my food come from? Who's supplying it? How do I know that it's safe? How do I know it's hygienic? Um, do, does food have to look good to be nutritious or can it be ugly and strange? You know, should I grow my own food? You know, should I be, should I be cooking more? Should I be making, you know, all of these things. And it is like a cliche in many ways, but at the same time, you, 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 we're being forced to ask questions we haven't been asking ourselves for for all of for my whole lifetime you know and again if we don't take that with us then we'll have lost something so when we go to think right the easy option is to get the takeaway the easy option is to go and eat out are we going to slip back into that are those places still going to be around because a lot of businesses no doubt are going to go under after this uh, are we going to have enough money individually to be able to do the things that we used to do um to be able to eat out with regularity to get takeaways because that's an expensive way it turns out to get our food and I, I don't know the answer to that but I do hope I don't, I, I, I don't hope that people haven't got enough food to uh, enough money to enjoy their lives and go out and stuff but I do hope that they appreciate whatever it is they are able to afford and understand where it comes from better than we did before this this crisis because again the price that's being paid has to buy us something you know and the next issue that I think we're going to struggle with is when it comes to, um, you know, like fresh produce going forward, because there's no one necessarily there to pick it. Is the price going to go up when because it's more manpower? 
are things going to change in that sense as well? So it, either maybe the food's not going to be there necessarily, or it is going to be there, but it's going to be a, you know, a lot more expensive than usual. Well, I mean, you know, you look at growers in this country now who are, um, who are saying there aren't enough people to, to, to get out there in the fields and, and harvest what they've got. And, you know, we could get into a long political chat about the reasons for that. Probably best we don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is, is, but, you know, it, the, the reality is uh, that farmers are, are crying out for people to go and pick in the fields. Are we prepared to do that as a nation? Are we, are, are we prepared to do it without bringing people in from overseas? Um, to do those jobs, I I honestly don't I don't know the answer to that. But uh, if we want to be self sufficient as a country, we're going to have to find a way to do it. And if it's not bringing in people from overseas, we're going to have to find people in this country that are willing to do it. Or we are importing food from places from whom we're trying to be self sufficient. Mm. You, know you know where I'm going with this. Yeah, the vicious circle, right? the whole thing. <laughs> I'm just saying. If the answer is not the way we've always done things, somebody's going to have to come up with something else, something that works. So, OK. <laughs> <laughs> now, we must go on okay. to talk a bit about Watchdog, because obviously Watchdog has changed slightly in the way yep. that it works, but it's, it's now found its new home on The One Show. So yeah. how did that come about? I mean, how did how did that you know become a thing? <laughs> How did that become a thing? Okay, so you know the BBC, right? Yeah. Uh, the BBC is a fantastic organisation. Um, and uh, what it did, it had a look at the way that Watchdog was working. And it said, is the, this the best way to use the resources that we currently had? And it decided, uh, after a little hiatus, that the best way to do it was to put it on the one show. Um, that's where Watchdog started, was as part of wide, which people see as the precursor to the one show. And so there are, pl there are pluses and, and, and minuses to, to all things. Uh, the minuses to that is th th that you don't necessarily have a programme which is just devoted to talking about consumer issues um, in the heart of the, the primetime schedule. OK, so if that's what you think is important, then, at, then you will see that as a, a negative, okay? The, the positive about it is that we were at a stage where Watchdog was on for six shows in the spring and six shows in the autumn, and there was nothing in the rest of the year. Um, so what we now have is the ability to, to keep going all year round. And uh, I'll be honest with you, if you are a chief executive of a company and Watchdog is on your tail, and you look at the TV schedule and you say, they won't be on air in five weeks time. We'll just, we'll just sit and ride this out. Um, now what we have the opportunity to do is keep going and keep on their tail the whole time and not give up, which is always the key. Because if you have a, if you have a half an hour of, of shame or five minutes of shame in the evening and then that's it, the, the pain's over, that's not a big deal. But if you keep coming back and you keep dealing with the issue or you know that there's the opportunity to do that, you're much more likely to put things right quickly uh, rather than keep that persistent, you know, nagging uh, pain from somebody like me bringing up the thing that you got wrong. So, <laughs> so you know what, there are, there are positives and negatives. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest, uh, early on when they said, uh, yeah, we're not doing it like that anymore, I thought, is that right? I'm not sure. And I'm going to keep an eye on it to make sure it's as long as it's doing its job and people feel like it's doing its job, then I'm happy to be involved. And if it stops doing its job, if they take the foot off the gas, I feel like people aren't getting the watchdog service they deserve, then I'm not going to be interested anymore because, you know, it's the same as anything else. I'm looking out for members of the public and I want to make sure they get the best deal possible. And like you say, at the end of the day, the thing you want to do is make sure that people are getting the, the, the resolutions, the, the, the sort of solutions that they want. You know, they want to feel that they've been looked after and that, that they've had a bit of justice if someone has done wrong against them. So yeah. I think it's the perfect, it's the perfect sort of, um, you know, the show for people. And as I say, having it as part of the one show, it kind of, I think it, it fits well to the one show format as well. Um, because you can, you can investigate anything really. 
yeah, you really can. And it's, it is, it's the right audience. It's the right time of night. Um, you know, already with the one show, people feel like there's a, they should, if we're getting it right on the one show, they should feel like they're cared about, you know, and, and that there's a, there's a, there's a team of people with whom they're included that can bring about change, that can make things better. I think that's why it's a really good fit. Um, you know, and, and I, I, I hope that as we go through, I am convinced and people at home are convinced that actually we're doing a better job than we were doing as its own show. But, you know, that you don't prove that in a week or a month or even six months. You prove it over over years and people go, actually, you know what? It's better than it ever was, you know. And I, su I suppose as well at the same time, kind of now is a real testament to it because it's moved across and sort of joined the one show at this time. So does it make it harder for you to, to, to get the answers people want because of restrictions and stuff like that? Or would you say it's made it a bit easier? I think... Um, I think what we were really experiencing was that companies felt like they didn't have to give us an answer. And so you'd sit and you go, what is going to make them do this? Are, are we going to like proper full on shame them? Um, and then you think, well, that's not really a very modern way of doing things. It's not, that's not what people react to. What I would rather do is make it an ongoing conversation with these people and say, listen, just like I do in Rogue Traders, it's like you pop up and you go, do you know what? I don't understand why you're doing things this way. And then see what their answer is. And then the next week you go, you're still doing things this way and I still don't understand it. And look, all of these people now think you've got it wrong. Do you think it might be time to change or do things better or help people out that have been let down? And then the next week after that, you go, do you know what? We're not getting through here, are we? <laughs> you know I mean? So it's like, it's a conversation which is based on questions which are all about your, you don't understand why they're doing things that way. And then people, generally the audience, are going, no, I don't get that either. I don't think I want to go with these guys. I think I might put my money somewhere else. At which point, they'll start to listen and they'll start to change their behavior. So rather than going full guns blazing and trying to make people look stupid, it, you've got to recognize that people who are the other side of a, in a call center or working in a company that you're part, they're customers too. You know, they're people who in their lunch hour have to deal with their bank, you know, so you can engage with them and they will empathize because they're trying to get by in the same way that you are, and by trying to like, ask those questions, they're just like, man, would you would you like to be treated that way? I suppose that's what it comes down to. It's like, do you think this is okay? Because nobody else does. Um, you know, you can tease it out over weeks and weeks and weeks, and that gentle drip, 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 that's how you get results at the end of the day. It's not by one big hit, big result. Doesn't tend to happen that way now, I don't think. Would you say, especially with, as well, things like social media, have you had, like, do you get lots of people that will contact you directly and go, I've got this issue, can you help? Yeah, and the, the big problem with that is that there are so few you can actually help. Um, what, you, what you have to be able to do is rather than, because you, it feels with social media like you've got that personal connection and that, you know, if I write to him, he'll sort me out. And I, you know, I, it's a sort of massive anxiety for me because I... I look at these people and I see their faces and their names and, and there they are. And they're, they're asking me directly to sort things out. I'm like, I'm, there's literally me and there's my team, obviously, but I can't sort all this stuff out. Luckily, they usually also include Martin Lewis and Dom Littlewood and, you know, Angela Rippon and, and everybody else that's, that's trying to do, <laughs> do similar things. So I know it's spreading the weight a bit. Um, but you do, you do think, uh, I, social media has that intimacy I think about it which makes you think I've got through to them I've and then but then with that is a why are you ignoring me and um, it's just there isn't enough time in the day to to service everything that's going on you know and take on everybody's fights and I've personally I find that really kind of upsetting god knows and, and I've only got like 20,000 followers if you're Martin Lewis he's got like millions 
it, the pressure, I really feel for Martin at the moment because he takes on so many different spheres of people's consumer life. And there are so many people expecting so much from him. And I think that's not to be underestimated, you know, what the, the, the incredible work he's doing and the, and the incredible pressure he must be under right now. I was going to say, I mean, at the moment, especially not just normal issues, I think people that, you know, they're having the issues with, you know, you know, the sort of the normal things, but they've then got the added pressures of cancelled flights due to coronavirus, cancelled holidays, cancelled anything that's been, you know, cancelled due to this situation. I and think that makes it even harder. And not, I mean, the travel situation is, is really, I find that really, um, a really difficult one to crack. Because if you say to everybody, right, bearing in mind that they've said there's an indefinite tr ban on non-essential travel. If you say to everybody, the letter of the law says, you get your money back, yeah, you get a cash refund. Well, I tell you what's gonna happen is everybody's gonna demand a cash refund. The travel companies, a lot of them will, will go under, they won't have the cash, they won't have your holiday anymore, that'll be gone. There'll be a huge burden on the protections that people have in place, like at all, up to those things, they will or won't be able to cope. Some people won't be protected because they've taken out vouchers, they've received vouchers instead of those refunds. And you've got this situation where if you demand, this is so, such extraordinary times, if you demand your refund right now, you could have the opposite effect. You could end up causing the collapse of half of the travel industry. Now, the other side is it's not morally right for travel companies to hold on to your money and basically use the British public, traveling public as a bank. That's not right, okay? It's not morally correct. But at the same time, we, if we accept we're in this together, just a little bit of tolerance and the government being a bit clearer about what's going to happen and the time frame where it's going to happen and what's backed and what's not backed, that might get us to a better place than everybody saying, right, I want my money back. A lot of people can't afford it. A lot of people need their money back right now because they're skint. Um, but just a little bit of tolerance about, about a company that we're so used to saying, right, you know, it's me against them. Uh, you would go a long way right now. Just just give them a couple of weeks before you just go chasing that that refund. And that's obviously that goes against everything I've ever said. Mm -hmm. I'm like the get your money back guy, you know. But it just doesn't feel like now is the moment for, for to be that black and white, you know, that straightforward. Now, obviously, you've been spending a fair bit of time in the one show, in the one show studio. Um, so how has that been? Because that must be a very surreal situation, because obviously you yourself, uh, Alex Jones, uh, any other presenters in the studio, you're obviously having to distance from each other. I imagine there's also a skeleton crew. So what is that like in a studio environment? First thing to say, right, is Miss Alex Jones it just is holding the whole thing together in a way that you... It, it, on TV, it may, she may like make it look easy, but actually so much of it is about proximity and warmth of feeling and, and closeness. You know, that's what that program is about. And she manages to do that when people are still sitting over two meters away or on a screen somewhere with the delay and the lag and the rest of it. So to achieve that is, is remarkable actually. And, and she's doing an absolutely brilliant job. Um, but there's also a sense when I, when you go into the, the one show that we are in extraordinary times and anything that you can give to people, you know, when doing that normally is that's your job. But now if there's like anything you can give to people that will help them um, get through to the end of this, whether it's about money, whether it's about um, a sense of community, whether it's about how, keeping each other safe, anything that you can give them is good. So although it feels distant you know this whole it is another cliche we feel together while we're apart and we sit apart from each other in the studio but we are for the, probably for the first time really feel like we're all on the same page because we there's something we have to achieve which is making people feel included and better and like we can get to the other side of this you know and the other thing is obviously with traveling uh, to and from the studio i imagine you're obviously having to kind of you know maybe make your own way there and get there under your own sort of steam so how how has that 
you're obviously different to normal for yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I use public transport all the time, uh, which is probably why I, I got a bug so early on in this thing, because I'm always out there. I'm on trains, I'm on tubes, you know, um, that's, that's just a big part of my life, but not anymore. So what I have to do is I have to drive and park for free, like two minutes from Oxford Circus, uh, and I park on the street for free, which is amazing. <laughs> I don't take it for granted. I know yeah. um, and then walk to the studio and keep my distance from everybody that's there. So, and it's, you know, you've probably seen the pictures. London is, is like a ghost town right now. There's, there's so few people around. There's no traffic. Uh, you can get wherever you want to go. It's, it must have been what it must have been like for my dad in the 60s. Um, you know, just park it on the pavement. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but it is, it's, it's, it's uh, very strange and i don't miss public transport um but at the same time i wouldn't want it to continue like this for for too long because you know one of the reasons i do what i do is because i just love being with people i really enjoy meeting people face to face and reading their faces and trying to understand the little nuances of how people speak to each other and communicate and just trying to make trying to make a story out of that trying to trying to make that feel real as you kind of understand what they're going through and I, I do miss that I miss that that community and I miss working with my team who I love as well. Now I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you it always is a pleasure talking to you um, so thank you for joining me anything you'd like to say to anyone uh, watching or listening out there? Oh man I don't know I, I just think um, you know it is an extraordinary time and, and it's a sad time for a lot of people but there is there is always i just think for that price there is so much to be gained we shouldn't waste it we should keep our eyes and ears open to what's going on right now and make sure that when we get to the other side of this we've we've learned some important lessons That's, that, i don't know i don't know what do i know matt i don't know <laughs> thank you so much matt it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, yeah we'll have to uh, do this again sometime real pleasure matt you take care of yourself you too